All right, next up, uh, Joy Boyer is going to take us to the second concept, which is the renewal of the LC Centers of Excellence in LC Research, or CEDAR program. If Terry doesn't steal the microphone. I was willing to let Terry talk through my uh, presentation. <laughs> So um, this is a concept theorist for a limited competition reissue of our Centers of Excellence in LC Research, or SEER program, RFA. And, okay. um, just some information on the SEER program. I know most of you are familiar with it. Uh, the first grants were funded in 2004. So we're entering our 15th year of the SEER program. The goals of the program have not changed over that time. There are three. The first is to support the development of transdisciplinary research teams that can integrate a wide spectrum of um, social science, humanities, uh, clinical science, um, behavioral science methodologies with genomic uh, research. The second goal is to facil facilitate the use of the findings of this research so that they can be used to inform um, health research and public policies and practices. And the third goal is to um, support the development of the next generation of LC researchers. In the past, we used the P50 full center mechanism and the P20, which is an exploratory or planning grant mechanism. In 2015, we switched to the RM1 activity code, which is complex project, project for complex things. <laughs> um, and uh, we reissued the RFA last in 2017, and we are still using the RM1 activity code. So some background, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, since 2004, we've supported 11 full centers and eight of our planning centers. We're currently supporting five RM1 centers. Um, and I would mention that we uh, provide four years of funding for these centers with the opportunity for one competitive four-year renewal. We find that it's important to have that renewal period in order to um, help develop some real sustainability for these transdisciplinary teams. In 2018, this year budget was about 5.2 million, and that's approximately 24% of the LC budget. So this map was, um, I had a lot of help <laughs> with this from our wonderful program analysts, uh, Alex Raphael and um, Natalie Pino. But the uh, green stars represent the RM1 centers that we're currently supporting. You can see the University of Utah, Jeff Botkin is a PI, uh, University of Oklahoma, Vanderbilt University, Johns Hopkins University, and we just recently renewed Columbia University for their final four years of funding. The um, purple stars and the purple ovals represent our graduated SEERs. These are SEERs that are no longer receiving support from us. Um, I won't go through the entire list. Um, the ovals obviously are the centers that um, received planning grants uh, in the past. I've added on to this, um, we've recently funded two T32 or NRSA institutional fellowships. And we funded one at the University of Michigan, one at University of Pennsylvania, which was a former SEER site, and one at Stanford University, also <coughs> another um, former site of the SEER. And the explosions are our new <coughs> diversity action plan programs. We've just funded those this year for the first time. Um, we have a, a new diversity action plan at the University of Utah, which is focused on disabled students. We have a, a diversity action plan at University of Oklahoma, which focuses on American Indian and Native Alaska students, and um, a center at Johns Hopkins, which is teaming up with some um, local uh, minority-serving institutions 
to develop a, a training program and research experiences. So um, just a few words on the accomplishments of the SEER program. We really view this as an extremely successful program. They've successfully established these very productive transdisciplinary research teams that have integrated both ELSI and genomics research. Um, and a sign of this is that a lot of our PIs have served in, um, a, as investigators and some of them as PIs of some of these large genomic medicine programs like the CSER grants and the eMERGE projects and the newborn sequencing or NSITE projects. Um, they've developed a lot of resources that have been used by policymakers. They've done um, white papers and policy briefs that have been used to inform federal and state legislation. They've testified before Congress and state legislatures and also a number of advisory committees. And they've also served as both members and chairs of some of these uh, national federal advisory committees. <coughs> They've also generated uh, support at their institutions for transdisciplinary ELSI research. And in some ways, they've really put ELSI on the, the radar screen of their home institutions, where I think it wasn't, it wasn't recognized before as a, as a real discipline. And most importantly, they've really nurtured the next generation of, of ELSI researchers. And we've seen more than 150 um, undergraduate, graduate, postdoctoral, and junior faculty fellows come through the SEERS over time. Many of these have gone on to tenure track positions in academia. A number have gotten uh, career development awards through the LC program and through other institutes. And we're now seeing, um, uh, I think, a dozen of these trainees have now successfully compete, competed for individual research grants. So we're very proud and pleased of of the role the centers have played in, in that. So now as we're moving forward, um, since the program was funded in 2004, we're seeing a real evolution in both the genomics and the ELSI landscapes. I think everyone's aware of the increasing use of genetics and genomics in healthcare settings and with diverse populations and in diverse communities. We're seeing some very rapid advances in genome technologies and um, these are now more accessible and have the potential to be used um, in a way that we haven't seen in the past. But on the, on the other side, I think in part due to the efforts of programs like the SEERS, we're seeing some very strong genomic ELSI partnerships to look at some of these issues as they emerge. We're also seeing a very deep and diverse pool of young ELSI investigators many of whom are now um, submitting their own competitive research grants. We see multiple institutions with, the LC, with LC research capacity. And all of this is, is happening within our ongoing strategic planning process. So we find ourselves um, kind of at a moment where we're contemplating the future of, of LC research. We're, we're looking at the changes in the research landscape and we're undergoing a strategic planning process. So we really feel it's a good time to examine all of our ongoing LC initiatives. And um, in this process, we've decided to limit the growth of the SEER program through 2023. And what this will mean is that we will allow the existing centers who are eligible for their final four-year renewal, there are four of them, will allow them to compete for funding for that final four-year renewal. Um, this will allow them, hopefully, to uh, develop full sustainability as a center. It will also create the flexibility for us to develop new initiatives based on the strategic planning process and really addressing some of the new needs that are coming up in genomics research. Um, and most importantly, it will ensure that we can continue to support our investigator-initiated research and career development activity portfolios which have always been a really important part of the LC program. So um, in summary, we're proposing to issue this RFA as a limited competition, which will be restricted to the SEERs that are currently eligible to compete for renewal. Um, the budget, as it has been in the past couple of RFAs, 
will be limited to 650,000 direct costs a year for four years. We're hoping to make um, up to $4 million available to fund up to four uh, SEER renewals. Um, and this is our proposed timeline. We hope to issue the RFA at the end of March. Uh, with application receipt date should be mid-July of 2019. Peer review will be in the fall of 2019, and these applications will come back to council next February, February 2020 for second level review, and we hope to fund in April or May of 2020. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I did ask Gail Henderson and Wendy Chung to lead off the discussion. So if there aren't any immediate questions, I will turn it over to Gail. Okay, thanks. Well, I, you know, um, I have a, a, a pretty strong conflict of interest about this program since I got a planning grant in 2004, um, a P50 in 2007, and another and a renewal in 2013. And now I'm in a no-cost extension. <laughs> so it's just about over. <laughs> so I have a little bit of a benefit um, that I've we can experienced in my career. But um, there's a couple things I wanted to say. Um, first of all, um, it, during this time, the, the Sears, I mean, I think Joy did a way better job than I was thinking I might do in terms of um, highlighting the just extraordinary change that genomics has undergone and that ELSI has been in many ways responding to, at, anticipating, and and being either at the center of or on the margins of this just the sea change in genomics. So, and the, the way that genomic medicine has, has arisen, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been, a, it, it's been a whirlwind of trying to keep up and learn and, and grow and develop. But the, the one thing I wanted to point out to everybody was that one, the, one thing the seers were required to do was offer a theme. And so you may think a seer was a seer was a seer, but no, not, really not at all. That's really not true. You could think of them as big R01s in one sense. Um, and, and so I wanted to just run through the list of themes because they, I think it's really important and each seer has been required to be, you know, to create a training pool of diverse investigators to publish as much translationally oriented work as they could, as well as focusing on, you know, the, the home disciplines of, you know, people outside of the basic and, and medical sciences. But, but, and yet within that, we've got, um, we've got IP, patents commercialization, which was, which was Bob Cook Deegan at Duke. Um, we had the genomics of behavior, um, Mildred Cho at Stanford, which in some ways is taken up by the not really entirely by the Columbia SEER, which looks at psychiatric, neurologic, and behavioral genetic information and its impact on stigma and self-image. Um, Wiley Burke's fantastic SEER at the University of Washington, Seattle, which focused in, in its entirety on, on health equity issues. Um, now there's the University of Oklahoma, which is carrying that mantle um, to uh, Native American and Alaskan populations. Um, I think, and it's a very exciting place, Oklahoma, I've heard, <laughs> never been there. Um, and there's, um, our work has been, has morphed into um, public health preventive genomics. Um, Utah is looking at um, how family members communicate about prenatal and newborn screening and um, how test results get commuted communicated decisions get made. Vanderbilt's looking at privacy risks, mainly. Vanderbilt's also looking at the ways that community can be engaged. M many of us have had a big community engagement focus. Um, Penn, um, when it had a SEER, looked at uncertain, uncertainty in genetic information specifically. And then Hopkins um, is looking at genomic information to help manage the prevention, control, and treatment of infectious diseases. So, and I think that's all of them, but you can just see this wealth of topic areas. And then we bring the LC, um, you know, the LC really big uh, range of disciplinary backgrounds. And then, and then one more thing about this is that over time, 
I think uh, partly because of the changes in genomics, um, small studies that would be conducted by anthropologists to look at the meaning of genetic or information for patients in really basically a small scale kind of way, trying to develop some policy orientations has, and, I'm, and they, these were very important, mainly ethnographic studies, has morphed into a focus on um, health psychology, health economics, um, the ideas of behavioral economics, um, and incorporating other kinds of disciplines, also incorporating the ways that the arts can be brought in. So, so the LC disciplines themselves over time have changed. Now, is this all because of the seers? Mm, probably not. <laughs> and yet, the seers have really, I think, been instrumental um, in creating um, both a diversity of topics and communities and also enough of a core um, in terms of yearly meetings, in terms of trainees getting to know each other across institutions, that that kind of a program it could never have been accomplished with you know, an equal number of R01s focused on an equal number of diverse topics. Um, and Joy obviously also mentioned that a lot of LC investigators have been, were mandated in the beginning to be brought into genomic medicine or cl the early clinical sequencing studies. And, and now, of course, many are without being made to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, and I, I maybe I'm, I think I probably took up my five minutes already, but but I really wanted to express how how important a program this has been. Um, that said, I do think it's time for a new look. And so I'm at first I thought, gee whiz, wait a minute, you know. And then I immediately thought, oh my gosh, what an opportunity to rethink where we are, and think creatively about new ways that the LC program can use its dollars, you know, and, and again, create new ways to, to have a community and also respond to changes in genomics. So, so I guess I'm pretty positive about this. I guess let's just say that. I haven't got any criticisms. I think it's just I wanted to say something about the program itself. Thank like you, it's Gail. just been so important. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Wendy. So I agree with what Gail had said. I mean, I think what the Sears have done is really this transdisciplinary bringing the communities together, and it's communities that otherwise would not have come together, and they're a bit of oddball in some cases, as you were saying, Gail, sociologists, economists, philosophers. Wait, oddball? <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers, but they're people yeah. that were there not some real glue to keep them together, they would not come together. And so if you were to, for instance, just have training programs, T32s or training programs or things like that, you would fulfill the training mission, but I don't think you'd get that community to come together and actually start functioning cohesively. Um, and I just want to second uh, what Joy and Gail had also said. The impact, I think, is not necessarily what we always traditionally see in terms of publications, but it's really been a lot of the policy implications and a lot of the other things and kind of non-traditional, at least from a scientific point of view, um, the impact. And so I don't underestimate that, I guess, is part of what I would say. Um, so whatever this is in terms of a transition, I guess my point would be to not lose some of that in whatever that is. Um, having R01 funded studies or training programs, I think those will do pieces of it. Um, and I don't know what you have in mind in terms of doing that, but keeping the communities together, uh, I think really has been successful in terms of the community, the Sears sort of across the country being able to learn from each other and really truly having now produced a new generation of researchers. So hopefully there's a creative way to think of making this even better, but not lose what's been successful. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. I'll make a comment from the non-expert side on this, that I think that this is an area of great uncertainty and difficulty for researchers who are actually not in the field, but they have to grapple with it. And having uh, an, invest an investment in this area should keep that in mind, meaning identifying kind of the, almost the help desk version of this. Not about the specific protocol. That's an institutional right. responsibility to approve and so on. But there are so many questions that people raise and that they have a hard time actually getting anyone to answer. 
and they, 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 they float about with their question, trying to get someone to tell them what are, is it that they're supposed to do or to mostly plan for, right? It's not about your IRB giving you some seal and some approval. And I think that's going to be an increasing need and something that these centers maybe should, should have under their realm beyond the broad policy. Great, um, thank you. Statement. I think uh, one of the, uh, some of the centers, at least the one at Stanford, actually provided kind of this consultation service for researchers in the field. That was part of what they I gave. think most researchers in the field have no idea. Yeah. Meaning they don't know anything about the field because it's not actually their field. So they don't know who to go to when they have a question. We encounter that a lot. I'm not saying that hypothetically. Yeah, we yeah. thought we need an advertising budget. <laughs> Possibly, and well, what is called outreach, right? We do that in genomics all the time, but that's an area where I think yeah. there's been less of that. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good point. I, I'd agree with that. So, uh, you know, teaching genomic medicine to undergrads and grad students, like you know, there are ethical questions that are coming up all the time in class around the papers that we read, and um, you know, I think that this sort of service is really valuable. Or the, this not not service, but this body of research. Great, thank you. If I can add, I think there's going to be otherwise a growing sense of discomfort and also things like almost memes can get attached to certain questions that are not the right way of thinking about them possibly, but they can be very damaging and problematic over time. So we have to be careful about this kind of educational outreach thing within our own genomics community because then those people become kind of the next step of ambassadors. And I have the same experience from teaching undergrad genetics. Students ask those questions. And you don't know the answer to them because it's actually not your area. You want to say the right thing, but you're not sure what the right thing is. So, yeah. Sharon? Um, just kind of a timing issue. Um, this announcement, at, well, the announcement about this limited competition is likely to come out before there's any new program, right? Correct. So I do think that it will be important somehow to talk about the fact that there is going to be additional funding. Because there's certainly, you've, you have funded many sites, but there are many sites that may have still been thinking about, in fact, we had a discussion on the way home, I think, from the last council or the strategic planning meeting about bail or applying or not applying or whatever. So I mean, I do think there are sites that are still thinking about applying. They're going to be surprised to see this. And if there's some language around as part of the strategic plan, we're looking at new mechanisms or making clear to people what are the open investigator initiated uh, programs. Right. Um, I think that will just help with the somewhat reaction to closing what view is viewed as a very successful program. Right. We. I, I would guess. I. I guess I would say we don't see this as an ending, more as an opening. To, to replace it with something. Um, well, but it's you know. an opening that hasn't opened yet, right? So that's, that, right. that's what I'm trying to say. So right. you don't have the next RFA ready to go out. Yeah. So to those people, it's just going to be a closing. Sure. So you may just want it a little bit like what was presented, I think, in the director's report, point out in the RFA, since it is a limited one, mm -hmm. what are the open LC funding programs right now? Sure. That's all. Right, because the money for those new opportunities is four years away. Yeah, that's right. right but there are other LC grant mechanisms, sure. ROs, and sure. things. Yeah. And, and I, I would just make a point of that. Yeah, in every RFA, we do um, try to highlight our our standing program announcements. So we will you make sure we do that. But it's just that I think there's a number of places that are disappointed to read that yeah. that it's only going to be available to those who already have SEERs. It seems that's one message that the SEER program has tried hard not to give that it's an inner inside club and blah, blah, you know. But, but people would really, would have applied. There's a number of places that would have applied for SEERs. They're, but they're just, they don't have that chance now. Yeah. But there'll be another thing to apply for. That's what we're planning. Um, any other questions? Thank you very much for these helpful comments. Okay, so can I have a motion to approve the concept? And a second? 
All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? No, he's just being a gentleman here. We appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff.